gonna talk about machine programming in the context of autonomous systems. And before I do, I would like to quickly point out that during this talk, most of the opinions are mine. Some of them are Intel's. Please don't sue us. And if your performance numbers are different than the ones I report, we can talk about it offline. Machine programming is really about the automation of software development. At Intel, we believe this is a paradigm shift. And we'll talk in more detail principally on why we think machine programming is possible today. But before we do that, it might be important to ask this fundamental question of why is automating software important for autonomous systems? Uh, as you can see here, there are a couple domains for autonomous systems that all use software in some capacity, whether it's autonomous cars, drones, planes, uh, smart homes, cities, advances in internet of medical things. Uh, most of these domains use software in some capacity or in a large capacity. So the question then becomes, what could we do if we could automate the software development and maintenance? What would, how would this impact these autonomous fields? What I'm hoping to demonstrate to you today is that there's at least three areas that we can improve on in autonomous systems as we move forward with machine programming. The first is productivity. By productivity, I mean us able to get these systems uh, deployed and developed at a faster rate. For performance, I'll talk principally about enabling the performance of the software that's underlying these systems to achieve potentially superhuman performance, things that even the foremost experts in the world can achieve on their own. And then lastly, we'll talk about reliability. This is mostly about the ability to detect and correct bugs in a variety of areas, such as correctness, performance, security, and if you're in the machine learning space, uh, accuracy. So let's quickly look at some examples where we might be able to apply these techniques along these three lines. The first area is productivity. Uh, I would argue that software is limiting the advancement of autonomous systems in many ways. One common example that we're seeing today is with autonomous vehicles. This is a headline from Forbes uh, at the end of June this year where they're specifically talking about how we haven't reached level five autonomy although lots of folks have promised that we should have reached it as early as, say, Q4 of 2018. So why aren't these systems available? As this author notes, one of the key limitations are the AI systems, that they're not advancing at the rate that we need them to, so we can't reach level four or level five autonomy. Now, in all fairness, there are some uh, corner cases, closed route systems, where they can achieve level four, but we're talking more of a broad scale thing, like trying to be able to drive autonomously in downtown Philly. Uh, later on in this talk, I'll show you how machine programming can actually automatically design some of these artificial intelligence systems. The next area is performance. Uh, what you may not realize is that the code in your systems is probably suffering from this thing called the Ninja Gap. The Ninja Gap is what we at Intel call the performance difference between an, an amateur programmer and an expert programmer. The expert programmers are generally referred to as ninjas. Ninjas are people that have a PhD in computer engineering. They deeply understand systems, compilers, programming languages, and hardware. What you see in front of you has been anonymized, but this is a real world example where Intel had a customer that was complaining about their software not running as fast as it should. And their belief was it was the Intel hardware. So we sent over an Intel ninja, one person, that worked with them for about a year, and the result is a 100x improvement in performance. It's important to note that the semantics of the original program were not changed, and the hardware that they were running on didn't change. The only thing that changed was the implementation of those systems. Uh, that's pretty drastic. Now you may be asking yourself, well, okay, so maybe my code is suffering the ninja gap, but that's easy enough, I'll just hire ninjas, right? Well, maybe not. Uh, there is a survey that was done in 2019 that analyzed the data that we have for 2017 showing there's essentially a 10x divide between the positions that are available and the trained, academically trained computer scientists that can fill those roles. So if you look at it from this perspective, 
essentially we only have about 10% of the programmer pool that can effectively become ninjas. So how do we fill this other 90%? And we're hoping that machine programming can play some role in this. And lastly, I would like to talk to you about reliability. I'm not gonna read this headline, and I wanna make it clear that I'm not pointing a finger at this particular company. What I do wanna make clear, though, is that it's my personal belief that the status quo is not acceptable. We've created a social norm that says software can have bugs, software can crash, software can have security holes, software can have all of these problems. And in some contexts, it's okay for these things to happen. But in other contexts, as you can see in front of you, it's not okay. Um, with all of these things together, I would argue that machine programming has the ability to start to address some of these things. And we'll see concrete technical examples of that shortly. But before I go into that and explain exactly what machine programming is, as, as is usual whenever I talk about machine programming, people naturally raise this question. Aren't you going to eliminate jobs? I would actually assert that we will not. And the reason is actually pretty simple. Machine programming is not meant to eliminate software. It's meant to enable all people to create software. What we're trying to do is allow all the people in the world that don't know how to write code the ability to create software. The programming part of software is handled by the machines. And this is why we call it machine programming. It's an important distinction because our 20 plus year vision at Intel is not machine aided programming, not machine assisted programming, it is machine programming. The choice of words here is very intentional. So hopefully at this point you're compelled on the reasons why machine programming is useful, the ways that it could potentially help you with autonomous systems. Now we can dive in into a little more technical detail. There's many ways to think about machine programming one of the common ways that people tend to think about machine programming is that it's all about machine learning. Or machine programming is a buzzword, it's really just a rebranding of deep learning. It's not. It's really important to understand that the way we think about machine programming is that it's a spectrum of solutions. On one side, you have these precise, mathematically proven uh, systems that are done by things like formal program synthesis. Is Rajiv in the room, by chance? I don't see him. So anyway, he's one of your experts at Penn in this space. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, you have things like probabilistic or approximate solutions. These are the systems that use things like deep learning. Uh, you know, these advanced neural networks, uh, genetic algorithms, something of that nature. And it's important to understand that between these two spaces, there are many different types of varieties uh, all within the scope. And different systems have different requirements. For example, when you think about computer vision, these are approximate solutions. It's okay for it to be approximate because our baseline is human vision. All we're trying to do with computer vision, at least at the most trivial level, is exceed the ability of human vision. However, if you go into the medical space and you think about the safety criticality of these types of systems, they must be correct because even the slightest mistake, let's say I have an artificial heart and it works 99.9% .9 of the time, but just happens to turn off on me for five minutes while I'm sleeping one night and I don't wake up the next morning, probably not acceptable. Uh, and then you can see that there's a fusion of a whole bunch of other things in the space of machine programming. Uh, the other thing that I'd like to quickly point out is that Within machine programming, many of these things not only are used to accelerate the field, but they'll be used as input. So for example, we may build machine programming systems in a particular programming language, and at the same time, we may ingest the code from that programming language as input to drive the machine programming system. So this sort of gives you an overall view to make make you uh, better understand that this is not just a rebranding of machine learning. It's not just uh, uh, deep learning uh, or deep neural networks 2.0. It's, it's actually something entirely different. <coughs> now, a natural follow-up question to this is, haven't others tried this? Uh, surely you're not the first to propose something this crazy. This is true. In fact, when we did our analysis 
my collaborators at Intel Labs and MIT, what we found is there's a paper that was written in the 50s by IBM where they basically sh said, with the advent of Fortran, we are going to automatically create all this software and machines will handle everything. Here we are 70 years later, we haven't quite accomplished that, okay? So what makes today different than the 1950s? I would argue that there's at least two things. We're at an inflection point and we've made a fundamental observation. So let's talk about both of these in a little bit of detail. First, the inflection point. Like machine learning, I would argue that machine programming is driven by the advances of uh, three different areas, principally. Advances in machine learning and formal methods, and you can see some examples there. New and improved hardware, this obviously is really critical as some of you that are in the space of machine learning know with uh, some of the stuff that Vinod's working on at NVIDIA, GPUs have played a tremendous role in the advancement of neural networks. And then also we have big and dense data. So let's talk a little bit about each of these. Everything you see under the bullet under machine learning and formal methods, these are all things that have been discovered or invented in the last three years, some of them in the last uh, 12 months. We believe that some of these pieces of technology are going to be fundamental to the advanced machine programming. Uh, second, you can see some of the different varieties of the new and improved hardware that we have. We've had CPUs and GPUs for a while, but you may not be familiar with these things called NNPs or TPUs. An NNP is a neural network processor. A TPU is a tensor processing unit. Uh, these are all t uh, pieces of hardware that are accelerating our ability to do machine learning. And machine learning does play a critical role in machine programming. I also want to just quickly draw some attention to BFLOAT 16. Just a quick show of hands, how many of you have heard or know about BFLOAT 16? Okay, great, right, because I, I expected as much. If you're not deep in the trenches of machine learning and you know a lot about hardware, you probably won't ha wouldn't have heard about this yet, but you'll probably start hearing about it really soon. What BFLOAT 16 is, is the observation that in many advanced machine learning systems, we care more about the uh, magnitude of the numbers we're representing than the precision. And so what we've done is we've taken something that was an established standard in 1985, single precision floating point, and we've recast it specifically for more effective machine learning systems. Now I think it's important to pause and consider this, that these types of changes don't happen without deep reflection. The implications of doing something like BFLOAT 16 means instruction set architectures change. Hardware potentially changes. So in order for people to adopt something like this, like Intel is, it means we have to be on the verge of something very big, sort of this precipice of this new frontier. And then lastly, I would just like to point out the growth of the programming data that we have uh, just on GitHub. So if you go back into 2008, just a little over a decade ago, there were around 30,000 GitHub repositories earlier this year we've exceeded 200 million. To put that in context, that's approximately a four order of magnitude growth in a decade. Uh, how many of you in the room are familiar with this thing called Moore's Law? Okay, right, everyone's familiar, right? So Moore's Law basically is saying, okay, roughly every 18 months, we're gonna double the number of transistors on a chip, right? If you take Moore's Law and put it in the context of the growth here, what's happening here is it's saying, Roughly about every two years, we're going to increase the size of the data by 10x. It's essentially Moore's law on steroids. Okay, this is, this is an enormous amount of data. There's two components to the data, too, to consider. First of all, it's big and that there's lots of it, but the second is that it's dense. And what I mean by dense is that in some of the fields, you have a piece of data and it, there's only one particular way to look at it. Uh, no disrespect to the computer vision people, I love all of you guys, but I'm gonna pick on you a little bit. Uh, if you have a picture, oftentimes the way that we analyze this picture is pixel by pixel. We basically just have pixels, and there's, there's limited, we're sort of constrained to the space on how we analyze this picture. With, and, and that's an oversimplification, right? So don't throw tomatoes at me. There's other things you can do, but let's, let's keep it simple for now. With machine programming data, there's many different ways to analyze this. The most obvious is that we look at the code, but then we can look at the comments. 
We can look at the function names. We can look at the documentation. We can look at Stack Overflow. We can actually run the code. We can look at dynamic behavior. We can do static analysis. We can look at things like the uh, SSA, the abstract syntax tree. We can look at hardware telemetry. So the point is, is that for any single piece of code, there's many different dimensions that we can analyze this. This makes it extremely interesting. It also makes it really challenging because what is the right way to look at this data? It's not entirely clear right now. So hopefully you, you are convinced that we're at this inflection point. Uh, the other thing that we think we've, <coughs> that is sort of adding to the, this pivot in technology is this critical observation that we made. So I've been working with a team of professors at MIT for a while, and we, we wrote this paper, and we, we scratched our head at this, and basically we, we, we made this profound observation. Programming is broken, right? Uh, it took us a while, but we, we, we pretty much determined that the way we're doing programming is totally wrong. Uh, so let me kind of explain what I mean by this. If you look at programming today, what you'll see is it looks something like this. The average programmer has some intention, and that intention is being expressed through algorithms, data structures, and system level details. The programmer is required to deal with correctness, performance, security, and if you think about machine learning, also accuracy. A single human being has to deal with all this. Now on top of that, once the code becomes stable and it's correct and it's running efficiently, something magical happens. The world around you changes. So you've developed this incredibly robust piece of software, works fantastic on your Android phone, and Google decides to release a new version of Android. And guess what? Your software doesn't work on that. This is a really challenging problem because now you need to keep pace with things that are completely outside of your control. I, I've written quite a bit of code myself uh, my PhD is in computer engineering. Uh, I, I'm pretty comfortable in these systems. I can't get this right. I can't write code that's correct, efficient, and secure. So how can we expect that people that don't have 20 years of industry experience, that haven't written a half a million lines of code, could possibly get this right? You know, this is an, an untenable uh, solution. We, we need to find another way. What we really believe we need to do is have the user just focus on intentionality. And the rest becomes automated away. So let's look at an at example of what this looks like. This is what tomorrow's programming will be with machine programming. We start with something very simple. The user allows to specify the program in whatever way he or she is comfortable in. In this particular example, we'll say natural language. And so the user says, computer, uh, create a program that notifies me when I'm near Starbucks. That's the program. So I've specified my intention. At this point, there's another subsystem, which we call the invention system, which handles the details of the implementation of the algorithms and the data structures. You'll notice that there's a bi-directional arrow going back to uh, the human intention. This is because the, uh, the user has done something sort of interesting. They have underspecified and overspecified the program. So in particular, Starbucks is an example of an overspecification. What they might have meant is just any coffee place. So there's gonna be a dialogue here. We call this conversational programming. The next is this word notify. This is ambiguous. What does it mean to notify? Do you, does your phone vibrate? Do you want a phone call? So these details need to be worked out. And then lastly, the word near shows up. Near again is ambiguous. What does this mean? And what does it mean based on the modes of transportation? If you're walking around, maybe near is 100 yards. If you're on a bicycle, maybe near is two miles. If you're in a car, what if you're in an airplane, right? So these are things that the user and the invention system uh, need to decide together. Now what's interesting though is there's also something that's completely absent in this program, that as human beings, we know but the machine may have to be able to try to automatically infer. So does anyone have, based on this program, does anyone have any idea of what sort of core critical piece of information is missing that we all know, but the computer might not? Yeah? Is it 
why you want to be near Starbucks? Why is a great one. Why, and why will actually get us to the answer. Because what the, what the user didn't specify is that I want to get to Starbucks because I want to get coffee. The computer can notify the user whenever they're near a Starbucks, but what if it's at two in the morning? It's not gonna be much help if that Starbucks is closed, right? So the point is, is that, that's, that's great, Rance, thank you for that. Um, the point is there will be dialogue and we'll uncover these things. And this, what makes it challenging is not only will things be underspecified and overspecified, certain pieces will be absent. And this makes it particularly challenging. Uh, next, once the invention is handled, we will then hand this off to what we call the adaptation pillar. The adaptation pillar handles the details of changing those algorithms and those data structures to a specific software and hardware ecosystem. One could imagine the program that you're generating is going to be very different if it runs on your mobile phone, on a $10,000 GPU, or on a cluster of machines in a data center. And there's a bi-directional arrow here because there may be some back and forth. And then lastly, data is essential. So no matter how you view machine programming in this spectrum, whether you're using formal precise methods that are mathematically proven, or you're using probabilistic systems that are using deep neural networks or things of that nature, you need data. Uh, so without data, none of this works, but thankfully we have an abundance of that. Together, all of these things we call the three pillars of machine programming. So this is a, a paper that we jointly published with uh, my colleagues at Intel Labs and MIT in 2018. This is uh, essentially the backbone of the new research group that we've now stood up, which is the machine programming research. It became active uh, last month and Intel has graciously allowed me to run the group, uh, at least for now. Hopefully they don't change their mind in six months. I, I guess maybe it depends on how well this talk goes. Uh, <laughs> write really good things in your blogs, please. Um, but the backbone of the machine programming research group is it's fundamentally driven by the three pillars, is whenever we're thinking about machine programming, we're thinking about it in the context of intention, invention, and adaptation. And I'll show you some concrete examples of how that works in just a moment. This is not just an Intel Labs thing, this is actually an Intel company-wide thing. Uh, earlier this year, uh, Liz had mentioned there was this tech leadership award that I, I received. This was from a presentation that I gave to the, the chiefs of the company, so the CEO, CTO, and it basically presented the argument of machine programming in the context of these three pillars. Uh, so now, uh, I'd like to give you a quick insight into the goals of NPR so you understand what we're trying to achieve, and then I'll give you some examples, some concrete technical examples of us making forward progress. We're really focusing on two things. The first is productivity. We want to minimize human effort. Our goal is to reduce it by two orders of magnitude or more. So if you take today's programming and you say this is 100% of what we're doing today, we want to get that down to less than 1%. Uh, pretty audacious. But there's actually early evidence that demonstrates that we can do this. The second is synthesis. We want to generate programs that have superhuman behavior in terms of correctness, efficiency, security, and accuracy. Uh, one way to think about this is we're writing code that has better, um, better behavior than the best software we have today in terms of various defects. You can think of correctness defects, performance defects, security defects, and if you're an ML person, this new category that we're constructing is accuracy defects. Uh, for example, you may have a model that you've built and then you change that model slightly. Uh, you see no problems with it as far as ingesting the data, but your accuracy declines. This would be an accuracy bug. We speculate that this is at least a two decade problem. It's probably much more, but to reach these types of things, we think we need at least two decades. And we also believe that we're gonna need large community support, which is part of the reason why I'm very happy that Rance is here on behalf of NSF. We definitely need to talk more <laughs> of NSF involvement. Okay, so now that you know the goals, uh, I wanna show you how uh, concretely Three of the areas that I talked about before, productivity, performance, and reliability, are being attacked through machine programming. But I want to highlight one thing, is that in this, in this following segment, I'm going to present to you some technical solutions that we've come up with. 
but I want to focus on this portion of scientific integrity. Uh, I've been doing research for 15 years or so, and there's a number of brilliant researchers out there, and sometimes I find that we don't do a good enough job <coughs> expressing the weaknesses of our systems. We do a wonderful job express, expressing the strengths. I think it's important as a community that we really focus on the scientific integrity. It's okay for a system to have weaknesses. It's actually expected that as someone that's constantly on program committees, if I see a paper that says, everything is perfect about this, it has no flaws, I immediately reject this paper, right? Because this, we do science, not magic, right? And with science, there are trade-offs. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk about this work, and keep in mind, the majority of this work is my work, so I'll be attacking my own work. Uh, but I'll present you with the pros, but I'll also present you with the cons. And part of the reason for this is scientific integrity. The other part is, my hope is you'll collaborate with me. I see one of my collaborators in the back of the room, <laughs> Sam. And so hopefully this will give you some inspiration on areas that we're working in, that we know there are weaknesses, and maybe you'll be interested in helping fill some of those voids. So again, back to the three pillars. I'm gonna talk about just a few examples. We really have dozens of projects that are in flight, but I don't have time to go into all these. But we'll talk about a quick example with intention, uh, one with invention, and then a couple with adaptation. There is one that I would like to quickly highlight, and this is the Machine Learned Data Structures Project. I'm working on this actually with Penn. Uh, so this is with Insup Lee, uh, Jim, and Oleg. I think I saw Oleg somewhere. And the lead grad student is Sam uh, in the back there. Sam, do you want to wave? So Sam is one of the sharpest grad students I've ever worked with. Definitely talk to him and learn more about this machine learned data structure stuff. Uh, I won't talk about it in too much detail because it's still early, uh, but we're really excited. This is actually on our roadmap for um, Intel. Uh, n n no pressure, Sam. But uh, <laughs> it it's on the roadmap. We have deliverables by 2021 to actually have this thing in, in one of our products. Okay, so let let's dive in. We'll start with intention. Um, just a quick show of hands. How many of you have heard of the programming language Halide? Okay, great. So not that much, uh, that's okay. Halide is a domain specific language. It's been around for about 10 years. It was written by this gentleman, Jonathan Reagan Kelly, when he was doing his PhD at MIT. And Halide was invented by Jonathan and, and Andrew Adams and others under the notion of what would happen if you built a programming language that divided the work of the domain expert and the computer expert. The notion is this language is mostly for image processing. And so you have someone that really understands the domain of image processing, but maybe that person doesn't have a PhD in computer engineering. So why expect that that single individual can handle all of this? Let's divide this. Uh, they refer to this as separation of concerns. We follow the same principle. In fact, Jonathan was coming up with this independently of when we were coming up with the pillars. Uh, at the last Kappa All Hands, Jonathan and I sat down and we realized, oh yeah, Halide is actually following the three pillars very, very closely. So what they do, what Halide essentially does, is it separates the programming responsibility into two pieces. You have the algorithm writer, that is handling all the image computation. And then you have the scheduling writer. This is the person that's writing the code that's making it performant. Um, one interesting observation I made last night while I was tweaking these slides is I noticed all the people that are writing the algorithm are happy, but the people that are writing the schedule are, they're, I don't know what that means exactly. And, and this is taken from them, right? So I'm gonna talk to them afterward why they're so sad. Uh, but anyway, yeah, so, what's that? They're Astros fans. <laughs> They're Astros fans, exactly, okay. Um, <laughs> Touche. Uh, so you'll also notice, though, that there are robots over there on the scheduling side, and that's really important because when Jonathan was originally designing this language, uh, from my understanding, in, in speaking with him, his goal was just to separate these two things out. But what they saw as they move forward is that when you separate these two pieces, it allows machines to handle one portion of that 
entirely. And that's a really important observation and why I believe we haven't been able to automatically paralyze a lot of work is because of that blurred lines that we saw earlier on the user's intention, the algorithms, and the adaptation. When you separate those clearly, what happens is it allows you to preserve the semantics of the program and explore the space exhaustively of the computational efficiency without perturbing the semantics. And that's actually what they did in their SIGGRAPH 2019 paper, is they built a, a new system that basically ingests the original algorithm that the user had written, and then it sends this through this iterative learning uh, model that you can pick a schedule that's quickly found within a couple seconds, or you can continue to iterate on it until it gets uh, a, a schedule that you think is, is optimal for your case. Now, this work is, I'm not a co-author on this, but this work is Kappa funded. So again, thank you, Rance. Um, and it's a fantastic system. What, what they have shown with their latest work is superhuman efficiency. Now, I wanna, I wanna be really clear about something here. At Intel, we have a lot of ninjas. Uh, if you're a software person like me at Intel, and you're not a hardware person, you're probably hired there because you can write really fast code. What they've done with these experiments is they took the world's foremost experts, which were them, the ones who created the Halide programming language. They wrote the most efficient schedules that they could possibly write, and then they had the machine do it, and the machine beat them. So this is what we're talking about with machine programming, superhuman efficiency. This is early evidence that the goals that we have with machine programming are attainable. Now, as I was saying earlier, I wanna be critical of all the work that we look at. So we aren't over-hyping this, right? We're grounding ourselves firmly in you know, what our actual claims are. So let's talk about that. Uh, first of all, the biggest limitation with Halide is it's domain specific. This only works in one domain. You can't apply this to some other domain. It's only for image computation. And being good friends with Jonathan, Reagan Kelly, Andrew Adams, Kayvon Fadahalian, all of the main people, I went to them and I asked them the same question. Can Halide generalize? Uh, Andrew says no. Kayvon says no. Jonathan says maybe. Okay, so I'm, I'm happy with a maybe. Uh, the, the big question is, can we move forward? What does the next Halide version look like? Can we build these types of solutions that can get superhuman results and not be domain specific? This is a very hard problem. Uh, just to put it into context, these are some of the smartest uh, researchers I've ever worked with. It took them 10 years collaboratively to pull this off. It's not an easy feat. And then the last thing is when I was chatting with Jonathan just a couple months ago and we're talking about the pillars, you know, I think we made the observation that maybe Halide doesn't perfectly separate the concerns, that maybe we have a little bit of the invention, that it's very clear that adaptation is separate from uh, the other pillars, but maybe invention spills over a little bit. And maybe with the next uh, language design, we can try to segment it more. This is an open question. I'm not sure what the actual answer is. Okay, so now let's move on to invention. Uh, how many of you, just another show of hands, uh, are familiar with genetic algorithms? Okay, great, so about half the room. Uh, for those of you that are not, no big deal. It, it's very simple. The idea is you use uh, iterations, right, to try to solve a problem. So you start with a specific random uh, blob of something, and then you just uh, permute it uh, over and over through this evolutionary process. And you do these things like crossover and mutation and roulette and it basically like you're grading these things as they're going forward. One of the weaknesses of genetic algorithms that people have criticized them for is that the grading system on those genes, this thing called the fitness function, tends to be handcrafted. You tend to have to write this uh, by hand. You have to code this thing. And in often cases, writing that fitness function can be more challenging than actually getting to the solution that you're looking for. And if that's the case, why don't you just go to the solution? So what if we could automate the fitness function? And so recently, that's what we set out to do. This is joint work with Intel Labs and Texas A&M, and we've built a system that uh, is able to automatically generate the fitness function 
for a, a genetic algorithm, we have a belief that it may generalize. Uh, and I want to be really clear about this. We don't have demonstrable evidence that it generalizes. But we also don't have demonstrable evidence that it doesn't generalize. So we've only looked at it in the space of program synthesis right now, which is a very challenging space for those of you who are working in there. Uh, and it would be very interesting to see what we could do next with it. Uh, and, and there's our formal methods expert that I was mentioning earlier, Rajiv. Uh, so this is one example. I was talking to you earlier about how the AI systems are limiting the advancement of autonomous vehicles. Uh, using machine programming, there are things we can do that can automatically solve some of these machine learning systems for us, if done properly. And with Netsyn, it turns out that based on our early evidence, uh, it's better than the state of the art in terms of finding more correct and complex programs. So I just want to describe those two words. Correct means the output of the program matches, uh, sorry, the, yeah, the output of the program matches the target output based on a given input, and that the complexity is that as the programs grow larger in number of instructions, our system has shown that it can find more of these programs than the existing state of the art. Things like deep coder and PC coder if you are working in this space, which is great. But going back to scientific integrity, let's talk a little bit about the weaknesses. The biggest one is that this thing is slow. That in some cases, we're seeing two or three orders of magnitude performance degradation over the state of the art. So while it is true that it can find more correct and complex programs, in some cases it takes significantly longer. Uh, in, you'll see here that the, uh, the bottom half of this table, these are all NetSyn, this is the system we built, and different optimizations. And something very bizarre starts to happen around 50% of the search space. Uh, we're not entirely sure what's happening there. It continues to solve and find more programs as you get further down into the space where the other systems fail. But this is certainly a weakness, right? And so we want to be transparent uh, about that. And then, yeah, as I mentioned earlier, we, we have hopes that the automation of the fitness function will generalize, but we've only demonstrated it for program synthesis so far. Uh, now let's quickly talk about adaptation. Uh, one of the most challenging bugs that exist out there are these parallel performance bugs. How many of you have taken like a parallel computing programming class in your life? Okay. Uh, so my PhD was all on optimizing parallel algorithms. And when I took the undergrad class, I had decided that I would never do parallel programming again because it was so hard. And then as fate would have it, I spent the next like seven years of my life just working in this space. Um, one of the things that makes parallel programming so challenging is it's very hard to know when you are degrading performance because oftentimes it's counterintuitive. There's things you wouldn't naturally uh, be able to observe. So for example, this is a real world example that we talk about in our upcoming NeurIPS paper. In MySQL 5.5, uh, they had this performance bug where all, all threads were contending on a single lock for a piece of data. And basically what that means is everyone's sort of trying to just get this value, they're all fighting over this one shared thing and they have to serialize themselves. So the MySQL folks realized that this was a performance bug and they said, I know, we'll just write it so each thread has its own lock and then they'll all work on their own piece of data and when you need everything added together, you'll just grab all the locks, sum all the values and then you've got it, right? Now what's fascinating about this is if you look at the MySQL 5.6 code, I don't expect you to like fully synthesize this, but from someone that has a PhD in parallel computing, this looks correct to me. There's nothing obviously wrong with this code. But what they didn't consider is the impact that it has on the microarchitecture, that it introduces this thing called false sharing. And because the profilers they were using were built in software, it changed the contention signature of the program so it didn't emit a performance bug. And then they released this code. And it degraded performance by 67%. 
this is definitely something we don't want to happen, right? It goes back to the other faults that we were talking about, that sometimes some of these bugs are so challenging, they evade even the, the foremost expert's ability to detect them. So can we automate the, the systems that will find these things for us? And with that in mind, that's why we built AutoPerf. AutoPerf is built to automatically identify these types of parallel performance bugs. We've demonstrated that it detects all of, in, in the early evidence we have, it's detected all of the performance bugs we've thrown at it, including the MySQL one that was not detectable by humans. Uh, and one of, the, one of the principal benefits that we've seen so far is that in the experiments we've run so far, it's emitted no false negatives. What this basically means is that we haven't seen a single performance bug that it's missed. Now, again, just to clarify, that's just in the experiments that we've, we've uh, run. I'm not saying that this behavior necessarily holds. But this could be very valuable because the last thing you want as an industrial leader deploying your software to accidentally per degrade performance by 70%. Uh, and it has negligible overhead. This is the big reason why we believe it works, is it uses a fusion of uh, autoencoders as a specific type of machine learning, zero positive learning, which if you're familiar with one class classifiers, it's a form of one class classifiers for just anomaly detection, and then hardware performance counters, which is basically hardware telemetry. Uh, so in, in, the, in the line of scientific integrity, one of the major weaknesses that we see with AutoPerf is it's possible that the false negatives, having no false negatives, is an artifact of the threshold value that we've set for the autoencoder. And in fact, I'm, I'm fairly certain that this is the case. Now, that doesn't mean that we won't be able to maintain zero false negatives, but it does mean that if you accidentally set that threshold at the wrong value, you could introduce false negatives, and that would be really bad. Right now, that threshold is uh, human decided, and we'd like to figure out a way to automate that. There's also a number of handcrafted configuration or hand configured parameters. And then lastly, this, this solution only works using hardware telemetry, hardware performance counters. I think I saw Joe DeVetti at one point in the back there. Uh, he's also an expert in this space. Uh, if you try to do this in software, which I have tried, it just does not work because the overhead that you introduce with the software probes changes the contention signature of the program and it essentially cloaks the performance bug. It's, it's very specific to parallel uh, software. Okay, and now the last example that I'd like to talk to you about with um, uh, adaptation is last year we uh, had this NeurIPS paper for precision and recall for ranges. And you might be asking yourself, okay, so we're talking about machine programming. Why suddenly are we talking about precision and recall for ranges? This is like something that you measure, you know, classification things with. Um, my argument is that when we think about the adaptation pillar, most of the time what we're thinking about is anomalies. We're thinking about trying to find defects. We're thinking about trying to find novelties. In, in any sense, uh, from my perspective, these are all anomalies. And precision and recall are fundamental to anomaly detection. They're generally the measurements that we use in, in conjunction with the F1 score to determine the quality of an anomaly detector. Unfortunately, what we've seen is historically, the point-based precision and recall does not work for time series or range-based uh, systems. The reason why this matters in the context of machine programming is that defects of any kind in software are usually a sequence of instructions. There are usually more than one instruction that causes the defect. Right? Unless it's a divide by zero and you just have the zero embedded, even that usually would take two variables, x equals zero, y divided by x, right? So it's a range. And then as you look at more complex like security bugs, the range can be very large. So what's important is that we have the proper mathematical measurements to test these anomaly detectors in a testbed environment to ensure that they're actually properly catching anomalies, so then when they get produced or used in the real world, they're deployed, they actually have the same amount of accuracy. And one of the fundamental problems that we've seen in autonomous vehicles, this is the other area that I've worked in, and by the way, BMW, I believe, is actually adopting this technology for their autonomous vehicles, is that the anomalies 
uh, that they're detecting in their sandbox environments are performing exceptionally well. And it's F1 score of like 0.99, which is just fantastic, right? And then they put it into the real world, and then the actual anomalies it detects is significantly worse. And part of the reason why we believe this is the case is the mathematical measurements we use that underlyingly grade these anomaly detectors are fundamentally broken. So we went in and we redefined those mathematical properties. We basically said that they should be extensible, flexible, they should work in a time series. Uh, our system also subsumes the classable uh, precision recall and it can work to uh, emulate other evaluators. So if you're familiar with this other thing called the Numenta anomaly detection, anomaly detection classification method, our system can emulate that. And the, the takeaway here is we really want our anomaly detection systems in testing to provide us with meaningful scores so that if they are performing really poorly, we know that in the sandbox environment before we deploy them. But in the context of scientific integrity, one of the big weaknesses here is that it's mathematically and computationally complex. For example, a fifth grader can probably understand classical precision and recall. Our time series solution, I would argue that there's probably four people on the planet that deeply understand it. There were five authors on our paper, okay? <laughs> uh, so I'm not gonna point any fingers. It might be this one that doesn't understand it, but there's complexity here. And we tried our best to make it simple, but this is as far as we got. This is an open challenge to all of you to simplify this thing for us. Okay, uh, now that I've gone through the research examples, I wanna just quickly touch on the fact that this is not a research toy. Those of you thinking that, oh, okay, Justin's talking about all this cool research, but no one's actually productizing this, right? Well, they are. Google Translate is one that is very well known. Google Translate is a tool that uh, you go into your web browser, I think maybe you can talk into your phone now, and you type in a sentence and it'll automatically translate it to another language. And here's the story of Google Translate. As Jeff Dean tells it, and Kunle Alakudin told it at NeurIPS in his keynote last year, originally uh, Google Translate was written with hand-coded rules, and it was 500,000 lines of code. Then machine programming emerged. In particular, a very particular slice of machine programming, which is called differentiable programming. And it's basically, in this context, the use of deep neural networks to try to automate some of these rules. They rewrote Google Translate. It's now 500 lines of code. That is a three order of magnitude reduction in code size. It's used over 500 million times a day and uh, to my understanding, the accuracy is actually better than it was before. This is absurd, right? This is, when we talk about productivity, for those of you that have been in large software projects, uh, usually the trend is, is as you add more code, it becomes more challenging to add more code. So not only is this a three order of magnitude reduction in lines of code, <laughs> it means that maintaining that code is probably easier adding to that code is probably easier. Uh, now this doesn't get into all the details of the data sets that they need and the infrastructure, but this is one early example where you have machine programming out in the wild used quite often with spectacular results. And of course, Google's not the only one. There are lots of other companies. Some of them are startups. Uh, some of them are more established like Microsoft, uh, Facebook, and, and others that are working in this space, uh, building real world products. So there's, the, the point is that even though this is a 20 plus year effort, we see that there's a lot of low hanging fruit. Uh, in closing, I wanna just quickly talk about some of the challenges. So as uh, I was hoping to get in place before this, this talk is a white paper that one of my colleagues uh, at Stanford, Alex Ratner, who is going to be a new professor at UW, he and I wrote together and we highlight some of the challenges we see in machine programming and they're listed here. Um, that white paper hopefully will be available at some point. Uh, just check my <laughs> webpage in 2020 sometime, hopefully it'll be there. But these are some of the key areas that we see that there are massive weaknesses. There are massive holes in machine programming uh, or potential massive usage, usages of machine programming that 
have some amount of uncertainty. So the first is structural representations. As I mentioned before, we have this issue with a big and dense data. It's not entirely clear what format we want to represent this data. If you're an expert in programming languages, I would argue that any of the existing techniques that we have, like single static assignment or abstract syntax trees, control flows, uh, control graphs, graphs, or even this new thing called contextual flow graph from NeurIPS 18 are not the right solution. We need something else. We are calling it the abstract semantic graph, and we have no idea how to build it. I would love for one of you to figure this out. Uh, the next is anomaly detection. Uh, I've spent several years working in the space of anomaly detection, and it's fascinating to me how immature this field is. There's, it works very well for simple cases, but for very complex cases, there's a lot of advancements that I think we need to make, which is sort of captured in our NeurIPS 2019 paper. Uh, formal methods play a very important role moving forward in machine programming. So we see that machine learning is getting a ton of attention, that's great, but formal methods are critical for a variety of reasons. First, we think that they're gonna be necessary for those cases where we need mathematically precise solutions, but also we plan to use these formal methods to verify the correctness or characteristics of our neural nets. And there's early work that's going on there with uh, uh, Guy Katz, Clark Barrett, Mike Kokoderfer out of Stanford, these things called um, uh, Marabu and Reluplex, and we have another system that we just built that is under review. So lots of room to grow there. The data and compute systems that we currently have today were not meant for machine programming. With the abundance of data and the new types of fusion of these different techniques I'm talking about, I don't think that we have the right data and compute systems in place. I believe that we're on a verge of a revolution, as I think Dave Patterson is constantly talking about, this domain-specific architecture. This is going to be another sort of revolutionary step forward as we try to figure out what the data and compute systems look like to make this thing efficient. Uh, you know, how do you process 200 million GitHub repositories? This is, this is computationally intractable right now. There's also questions of ethics. Obviously, this goes beyond just machine programming, but one could imagine whenever there's a human being involved, there are going to be questions about why the machine did certain things. I'm not an expert in this area. I'm constantly asked about the ethics, and I basically say, I have no idea. Please talk to someone that's an expert in ethics. Uh, hopefully some of you are in ethics or you know people that are. We really need these people to start helping us with this. And then lastly, this area that I think is, is very interesting and really exciting and also very dangerous is not so much the human assistance but human augmentation. Historically what I've seen, and again this is not my space and I know several of you are experts in the IoT of medical things. so. Feel free to correct me afterwards. But historically, a lot of the augmentation we've had on humans have been done for the purpose of trying to sort of reach the average human behavior. We're trying to build synthetic limbs so these individuals can be on this sort of equal level that other humans are at. However, with the advancement of machine programming, and we're already seeing certain one-off cases of this, people are actually augmenting themselves to not achieve normal human behavior, but achieve superhuman behavior. It's happening right now, you can Google it. Uh, people have things sticking out of their heads, this type of thing. Um, it's not clear to me how far this is gonna go, but I suspect that this is going to be a trend that will be adopted. And there are some fundamental questions uh, that I don't know how to answer, and most of the people I work with don't know how to answer on how we address these, specifically in terms of safety properties that we ensure that when people are augmenting themselves, uh, that it's safe. Uh, so I'm, I'm near the end, I have one slide left. Uh, basically, this is just my call to action to, for Penn and others that we wanna continue to work with thought leaders like yourself, so I'd like to thank INSUP and Oleg and Jim and, and everyone else that has been so generous to collaborate with me. We have a workshop called Machine Learning and Programming Languages that uh, Mayer, I don't know if Mayer's in here, but he's the program chair, Mayer's in the back there. He's actually the program chair, he's published at this venue. Uh, we're gonna have submissions open in a couple months. We, we would love to see more Penn. We see a lot of MIT, a lot of Stanford, a lot of uh, Facebook and Intel Labs, not as much Penn. I'd love to see that change. 
Uh, and then my group is, is growing. So if, you, if you're interested in this space, please let me know. Let's, let's talk offline. And uh, with that, I, I will conclude. Thank you. For more info on the Precise Center, please visit precise.seas.upenn.edu.